It always takes a couple of seconds. Yeah. Okay, we're good to go. Okay, hi everyone and welcome back to another saddle fit talk with Jochen Schlesa from Schlesa Saddlery. Today we're going to be talking about saddle fit issues in modern horse sports, even at the upper levels and pain behaviors and other issues that we see. Um, we only have half an hour, so we're going to just jump right into it. Um, so Jochen, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Shelby. I'm just going to turn my uh, video off so you guys can focus more on what I show you on my screen. Can you see the screen, Shelby? Yeah. Okay. So there is um, a lot of um, talk about horses' behavior or the, the signs. And um, sometimes we see um, veterinarians who also instructors like this gentleman here, Dr. Gerd Horschman used to, is still, I said used to be, but his first profession was he is a professional riding instructor and then he became one of the top veterinarians in the world and um, he had a, a big facility at the German National Riding School uh, where all the uh, not actually at the Olympic Committee where he had five veterinarians underneath him and he said to me you know I'm sick and tired of just um, treating the symptoms and um, not really getting to the not the symptoms, how he he said it, the, when I get the horse when it's too late. That's how he mm -hmm. said it. And um, he, mm -hmm. he sees how the horses are ridden. And he sees how it, it physical damage the horses. So when we talk about today, uh, about saddle fit, how it relates to how we ride and how it affects the horses, I always like to start with a veterinarian who has not only the science behind him, but also as a rider, as a professional rider, who who's seen how the industry took a little, I, I like to say left turn. In, in the slang word, we call it roll cure or hyperextension. And we see a, a lot of nasty behavior. So the horse shows a lot of pain and what is pain? Is, is the horse showing pain like we you show pain when we limp or when we cry? You know, and there is another veterinarian who, <laughs> excuse me, who has uh, uh, studied that. And uh, Dr. Sue Dyson wrote an ethogram. So how you recognize the facial expression when a horse is in pain. And it was so successful that now multiple universities around the world work on that to say, okay, the horse is in pain. So what, when is, when can I, if I don't have the veterinarian degree, see my horse is in pain? And well, it starts off if your saddle sits sideways. Why is my saddle sit sideways? Well, we humans are not even, but most majority, the horse is not even. And if your horse is not even, there was a good article written in the uh, Holistic Horse about orthopedic shoes for horses. And the reason why they do it, the primary goal of orthopedic shoes is to provide support, prevent injuries, to maintain a functional level of comfort for the horse. Same in orthopedic saddle fit. But when people read about orthopedic saddle fit, they all go, Ooh, ah, what's, mm -hmm. what, what's going on? And I like how, how they word it. You know, they say the Greek word for orthos is keep it straight. And number five in the writing scale is straightness. So, the best people who have dogs, who have walked their dogs and walked behind dogs, they can see how a dog runs on two tracks, clearly on two tracks. Mm -hmm. And horses, um, they, they also are not 100% straight. Okay, We want to have them straight because we put extra weight on their back. So when the horse is not straight and the saddle is not orthopedically fit, it will go sideways and it most of the time clips on the withers and they start atrophying through here. So why are horses not uh, uh, straight? Well, it could be bone structure. Look at this humerus versus that. It could be wow. musculature. Okay. The horse could have a transitional vertebrae. Very, it's not uncommon, very hard to detect, very painful, but the horse will deviate away from the pain. Remember, it's very important to remember this. A horse has 
a huge, huge pain tolerance. Why? Because if I show it, I get eaten. As a matter of fact, the second the horse trots, even if it's not in danger, it's in their DNA, they get this insane amount of endorphins injected to hide any kind of a lameness so that it can get picked to be chased by the lion. So, or they have at birth trauma, this, this is the first rib of the horse. Wow. You know, and you can see how uneven that is. That's and crazy. And you imagine... If you say, oh, I'm a good trainer, I make my horse straight on the lunge line or I train him straight, that may be good if it's just musculature. But we have numerous, numerous uh, issues, you know, where, like uh, Dr. Sharon Davis writes so well, you know, if, if the horse has this issues, we create lameness. And if we don't understand it and put a saddle on what sits diagonal, it makes it even worse. And then it's for me a, a constant struggle. So we all have horses seen with necks like this, where we see, like Dr. Robson calls this line a pain line. Many many horses have it, especially on the track. Mm -hmm. Okay, on the track they call it the fit line, or mm -hmm. some breeders call it the fly the fly line. Like when they shake off the flies, that's the fly shaker muscle. Okay, so that they sh you see that a lot. So one is it a fly shaker muscle outline on one is this a pain line. So then you see these dips on the withers. Okay? Yeah. That often comes if the braxial plexus is pinched. Now that nerve is between the shoulder blade and the upper and, and the rib cage. So the compression between the scapula and the ribs is massive and that pain travels down. Okay. 2016 was a great article which shows some horses are terminate lame, get either euthanized or just past the ponies because they can't figure it out. And yet we know for a fact, if the CN11, I'm gonna move that over here so it's more clear. If the CN11, this is this nerve, and mm -hmm. that's what you know as pain line. So that's the CN11. Okay, if that gets pinched by the saddle, the horse instantly ducks down his head, right? It drops the rib cage, right? It drops the rib cage or the base of the neck. So what you want to see is that the horse, this is the sternum, the elbow, lifts the rib cage. Look at how much space there is between the brachial plexus, okay? If not C5 to C7, these are the vertebrae on the neck, they're lock, right? And if you start to ride and train the horse in what we call a roll cure, where we behind the vertical and hind leg is in la la land. Mm -hmm. Look how low uh, the oh, fat wow. look is. And this person here, top level European rider, gets high marks. Same with this garbage. Mm -hmm. okay? So the back is super low, but the uh, people on the peanut gallery are the people who do not know the we call it circus trot yeah proper trot go in the audience and go yay clap 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 and then the uh other side where we see the people with um unfortunately corruption is not just in government it's everywhere yeah we we see people given a, a 10 for this trot or for this behavior Okay, versus the delim uh, elimination, right? It's clearly stated in FN rules, you get eliminated if you ride circus trot. And it has nothing to do, but no, oh, they give a 10 instead of ring the bell. This is a common picture in the eventing or in the jumping world. You know, the horse is like in severe pain, runs away, and we do all kinds of garbage to them. So if we know from scientists, and the ribcage drops and the brachial nerve plexus pinches, because natural is up, like a good rider understands who lifts the base of the neck, okay? On jumping saddles, very easy to see. <laughs> That's very clear mm -hmm. when that brachial plexus is compressed. You see the legs uneven. They come together in the front, like a V, and then the shoulder is out. And if I'm riding a big show class, or uh, I'm just riding for pleasure, or I want to clear a fence, the distance between the hoof and the sternum that's 15 centimeter. So I can lose this 
even though we have all the vets out there who show you what the saddle damage will do, I kind of trying to get my horse freedom in the shoulders. Right here's a, I just videotaped a, a little bit the upper arm. When the upper arm pushes the shoulder blade back, this comes back. But normally there's a lot of space there. So there should oh, be wow. no reason for it. So if a horse jumps properly, look at the space. Look where his hoofs are. Mm -hmm. They're wide apart. Okay. Who would have known that a nerve can create such an issue? Okay. We are very uh, slow to change when we say we, the human. Like if mm -hmm. I'm touching my funny bone, I instantly do a jerk reaction. So that's probably the easiest way I can explain it to all of you folks. If I want to really drive myself crazy, I just have to have trigger points and I make a jerky reaction. So if you want to drive your horse crazy, jerky reaction. This is probably one of my favorite vets out there because she's also a big, big show jumper, but she has lots of experience in biomechanic. She done a lot of dissections on all continents. This is just a snapshot out of a video we done with her a while ago about the back symposium, but just take the three minutes and listen to what she says. Horse would merely can not been lift. He wouldn't, there would be no jump to speak of. And if you look at him now, he's lifting through his shoulders. And one of the most beautiful parts, which you can just make out in the picture at the back here, he is pushing off the ground. And this is a novice, novice horse. And I can't tell people how, how important and how special this is and how much the saddle has enabled this horse to do this. He has never pushed up the ground like this. Now, the classic way of training show jumpers would be to go back, force him through, through many, many lines, force him into a pushing position, even if he is uncomfortable, even if his body couldn't do it, even if he was restricted. Um, you would then put him in lines that would force him to push with both back legs. That would have broken my horse. Um, and it does many, many horses because we're not addressing the thing that is stopping them from pushing. I don't know if anybody's ever watched a horse that is free jumping or actually just in the field jumping by themselves. They have no problem pushing. They only have a problem pushing when we're on their backs and we restrict them with equipment that does not allow them to utilize their thoracic sling, their abdominals and their back appropriately. There's another point on this picture. There's a reason I picked this, this particular shot. There are a few better shots where he's got much more, much more elegant technique of lifting his front legs but this particular picture shows you actually his thoracic sling coming into play and i'm just going to use my cursor if you look here you see his pectoral muscles in its actual groups contracting in order to allow this jump to happen and that is spectacular um it is very rarely seen and i think it's underrated because this allows the horse to lift and not just lift, he's lifting his entire sternum and he's lifting all his shoulders. And the freedom that it's allowed him is remarkable. Um, from this point of view, uh, I urge everybody to, to look for this when they're looking at a, at a jumper saddle, if you're looking at a dressage horse's saddle, it's not much different. You wanna look for elevation you know um i listened to a, a, a marvelous talk it was also with Jochen. i think it's a couple of years ago now but you know if you watch horses and you watch a stallion trying to impress mares the one thing they do to impress each other is they come off the ground they have a moment of suspension they hang and so this goes on and on and on in today's topic I just thought it was really impressive how you can see when the horse uses this. And the topic today 
you know, we want to talk about the modern horsemanship and the normalization of poor saddle fit. I cannot tell you, Shelby, how many times I see horses where the saddle is in the ring of light. Mm -hmm. You see clearly here that is this, the area, the lumbar area here from the back of the horse's spine. You see how these bones stick out. Yeah. It's just absolutely flooring me. The first thing saddle fitters learn is the length of the saddle. It's either too long, okay, or too short. And when people say, oh, your saddle is too long, but I'm going to help him a little bit and stuff him. It's kind of like you say, my car is not driving. Um, my pistons blow. Oh, let me wipe the windshield and then you're okay. Mm -hmm. What has that to do with anything? Just because I can now look out of the windshield, my car still doesn't drive. So if my, ho my horse bucks me off all the time or, or buckles every time I do a sitting trot and it's as if I step in a hole, get off the loins, ovaries. The kidneys attach from the bottom a muscle to these bones, okay? Get off that. That is, for me, in today's riding world, I don't get it. That, that with this modern horsemanship that we don't pay enough attention to this. The other thing is the insane amount of saddles would cripple the horse's shoulders, driving the saddle forward. I just showed you some very, very important nerves, the CN11 and the braxis, plexus, brachial plexus. So mm -hmm. if... It's just slight pressure, but this now it's like beyond that. So now that poor animal tries to do it. Never get me going with the crookedness we just talked briefly. And if I'm um, picked for a, a super sport, let's say I'm, I'm on the team on this volleyball or, or I'm, I'm picked for being on the tennis match or soccer or whatever. The last I want is that my shoes give me blood blisters. So my equipment, my shoes, for example, has to fit. And the saddle is for me, with today's modern sportsmanship, <laughs> especially in the upper level, it's just unbelievable. No matter how much money you get paid, some of the companies have up to 60,000 euros. Oh, my God. And the rider rides with stuff like this. I mean, how simple can that be? If your hand doesn't fit between your panels, don't put it on the horse. You will damage the horse. I mean, how can that be that we have today still people who believe if the saddle is bridging? This, this slide is from uh, Dr. Joyce Harmon from her book. Right? She says, make sure the saddle has contact in the middle. And yet, we got so many people riding with saddle bridging. And you know what they say? Oh, when the back comes up, the saddle will fit properly and my saddle doesn't move. Well, mm -hmm. back to the shoes. If your toes are wrinkled, like literally scrunched in the foot, your foot doesn't move either. You want to be able to move your foot in the shoe to roll up properly. The saddle has to move to, to absorb your weight and the horse's freedom in the shoulder. It's a misconception. I'm not saying the saddle needs to flop in the back like a fish out of water. That's ridiculous, right? You don't want to walk in a shoe where the shoe flies off the second you start running. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there's a difference. I, this is stuff what just doesn't, I, I can't comprehend. I see people who, who have saddles who dig into the bottom. You see this king and way too much room because I want to give him extra room. Or they're too tight here where that nerve is, what I was saying before. So that lady who we just saw the video of, okay, she has worked in the UK and the United Emirates and USA, United Kingdom, South Africa. And when I listened to her talk, I was unbelievable. All these deformity in these bones. See, this is how a normal shoulder blade looks like. So if I take a hammer, and I hit you with that hammer on your chin. Not only are you in massive pain, but your bone will grow bone. You will have a bump there forever. So these are the shoulder blades where the saddle slid forward. Right? Bone grows bone when it's mm -hmm. under attack. So if I look at now where we go, 
let's, let's take a step back. When is the horse happy? Where do they normally live in the herd? They live in the herd, they graze, had to stay on 17 hours, right? And then we start riding. And we have that conversation numerous times, shall we? Mm -hmm. so where, where people start too early, the horse's skeleton is not done until they're six years old. The old military style was the horse is three years old, you ride only three times a week, four times on the week, you work the horse on the ground each year, one day longer per week. Today, they go in these super expensive auctions. You buy horses for 600, 700, 900 thousand euros with three olds and they do flying changes right it's ridiculous never mind the racetrack or the western futurity mm -hmm. so if you ride a young horse properly and you build the top line then you have a horse for last you many many years but back to the horsemanship today we have people who make a living such as yourself okay which means you have to look more than saddle fitting. You have to feed them. <laughs> mm -hmm. You have to board them. It costs all money. And especially in today's in crazy inflation world we live. <laughs> so, so longer you have a horse in your training barn, so longer, so more it costs you. So the most trainers struggle with that. You know, how can I, if you buy horses and train them, get them through the program without doing it too fast. Mm -hmm. So the consumer, most of the time, an adult amateur rider who has the money, who starts late, here's the horsemanship experts at the trade fairs, anywhere from Monty Roberts to Pet Pirelli to Clinton Anderson, and the list goes on and on and on, what to do and what not to do. And then we got the reality world of how do we make all this work so we have the science you know who tell you the do's and the don't and then we have the reality so i as a rider have a choice you know do i need to ride like this well yeah if i get a gold medal for it right if this is my number one this the the rider you see here used to show a horse three times in the olympics so for three years olympics come by every four years that horse lasted 12 years mm -hmm. now you see one horse one olympic it's gone right you don't see them anymore because they don't sustain they, they, they cannot hold this so it's kind of it, uh, a hard topic when we talk about um, what is right, what is wrong. This is one of my favorite pictures. And um, this is a good illustration of what is always being preached since 400 years BC. If the horse is able, with or without you, to lift his back up, the horse's haunches can come underneath. Then he can lift himself up and the front will last longer. However, we see a lot of horses being trained and ridden like that for whatever reason. Okay. And sometimes we put big, big blocks on and change and all other stuff for whatever reason, sport, I don't care what you call it. So the, the, the struggle is out there for the trainers who want to do it right. The struggle is out there for veterinarians who understand, for example, acupuncture, if the saddle hits that spot or your mm -hmm. girth hits that spot, that makes a massive problem on the respiratory health. So if we have all this out there, where do I turn? Maybe you can, change, can tell me a little bit from your side what your struggles are and what you find out there Besides the cost of hay. <laughs> I find like with clients, it can be really, really, really hard to get them to check their saddles. Like even if you know it doesn't fit, they don't want to put the money in. Like I've I've actually lost clients 
um by telling them they need to get their saddles refit because they'll think that I'm like lying to them or like trying to scam them and stuff and it's like I don't get a payout when I recommend people go to us like I don't get commissions for sending people to the saddle fitter you know like I don't see any extra money from it um and more often than not I actually lose money because if the client's not willing to get a saddle fit and I can tell it doesn't fit then I kind of just have to walk um so I think that's one of the biggest problems that I run into as a trainer is that like sometimes people think that like I guess that we're moving towards encouraging more saddle fit as a means of just trying to get money for the people doing it rather than because it's the right thing to do. Shelby, do hit the nail on the head. And this is exactly what we're working on. And we will have what we call a trainer saddle. A trainer saddle, it's a saddle where there's no brand on it, no brand. And it will literally say, either trainer saddle or it will say therapy saddle. So the trainer has the saddle and he or she can adjust that saddle. When that person comes and takes a lesson from you, you make them ride in the saddle. Mm -hmm. So, and then they will see how the horse goes better, how the horse jumps better, does the dressage better. And then they go home and put their saddle on. Uh, My horse starts refusing. Uh, My horse is not going on the bed. Uh, He's not going forward. Uh, Wrong lead. Oh, let's take another lesson. Come back to you. So not only will you have more lessons, Finally, they will click and says, maybe I need a saddle like this. Maybe I need yeah. a saddle check. Unless the customer feels the difference, unless the trainer has a tool, I call it a tool, to use in their toolbox to give a customer the feel, this will never change. And the horse will keep being in pain and hurting and hurting and hurting. So how, what do you think about that idea? I think that would be good because, yeah, I think that's like a problem. Like <clears throat> morally for a lot of trainers too sometimes you have to choose between like getting paid or doing like the right thing for the horse so that's right being having more options would be good so that way your own saddle doesn't get wrecked and of course it's a little difficult if you have a riding barn where you have teach four or six people at once yeah then it gets out of control but if you have one client one saddle and you can literally in less than five minutes adjust that saddle and the saddle pad boom off you go that makes a massive role not only does the customer feel wow i really this is the best train i had i really can sit the trot now wow i can jump higher wow i have been with the other trainer for four years and i'm still only jump two foot one so stuff like that is what not only does the business good for you I'm not trying to sell you on the trainer yeah. side. I'm trying to, to, to explain the customer got to feel it first because they don't hear it. Yeah, no, I, exactly. Because, yeah, otherwise they don't believe it. No, they don't believe it. And there's enough trainers that are willing to just ignore that, that they can definitely find someone who will, like, move them on the timeline that they think they need to, which is, yeah. Exactly. Because of all the problems I was showing, right? Mm-hmm. But anyway... So I hope this half an hour was um, informative for you and your your client. And it's always something new what's out there. I mean, when I saw the first rib, how uneven that can be, you're no wonder I sometimes have a horse what doesn't take the left rein. Yeah. Trying to compensate for it. And if I don't have a saddle, what can orthopedically adjust it for that? then I never win. I just get yeah. a horse that gets sour. And sure, you can sell horses all the time and inject as much as beauty as you want into it, but that's not riding. That's just rape. Yeah. Good seeing you again. Okay, thank you. Yeah, have <laughs> a good care. day. And yeah, thanks again.